Boker Tov, and Shalom Elohim. It is Mikael here again on this 28th day of May in the Gregorian year 2014, and also the 28th day of Iyar in the calendar of Yah in the year 5999. We're now on Revelation 13. Um, we're going to go ahead and dive right into that. We are also drawing near to uh, Chag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, uh, what is also known as Pentecost commonly. So we will also have some dealings to do with that. But let's go ahead and enter into prayer as we get into another mouthful with this particular 13th chapter. Um, we're going to get in this. So here we go. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and hallelujah. Blessed are you, Yah, Almighty One, King of the universe, the Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, creator of heaven, earth, sea, and all that is in them. Abba, we come before you to give you praise and esteem, for you are worthy of such, Heavenly Father. We want to confess our sins before you and ask that you have mercy upon us and that you pardon us and that you cause us, Heavenly Father, to have a circumcised heart and that we have a fleshly heart, Heavenly Father, so we may hear, see, understand, turn back to you and be healed. We ask also that you write your words on the inward parts of our being, Heavenly Father, and write your law on our, on our hearts and in our minds so that we may do them. For we know, Heavenly Father, that those who live by faith will carry out your instructions and those who love you will keep your commandments. Abba Yah, we ask that you just infuse our mind with your spirit so that we may understand what your word says and what it means in these dire times that we live in, Heavenly Father. We submit ourselves unto you and strive to learn your ways, Heavenly Father, and walk according to your precepts and have you order our steps as we pray these things in the name of our high priest, king, redeemer, rabbi, bridegroom, prophet, and Mashiach, who is Yahushua, Baruch Hashem, hallelujah, and amen. So we got a lot to talk about today, and I may even come back with some articles um, separate from the scriptures to even more show you how a lot of this book of Revelation has been fulfilled. And we had talked about the 66 to 70 year period when Titus and the Roman army, the, Greco, the, the, the Hellenist Roman army destroyed Jerusalem and how that filled the three and a half years. But again, this is a cyclical matter. Prophecy is cyclical. And so we're going to look at a lot of this. From a preterist standpoint, okay, uh, there are um, futurists, there are preterists, and there are millennials. Uh, that word is kind of challenging for me to pronounce right now. <laughs> um, but we have a preterist perspective of this matter where it has taken place. A lot of these prophecies have taken place, as Yahushua himself even said that you know, some of you will not even taste death before you see all these things take place in your generation. So he had been speaking of particularly the destruction of the temple in year 70 under the Romans. We're going to go ahead and read all of this. Revelation 13, and then we're going to come back and we're going to dive, dissect it. So it reads as follows. Revelation 13. And I stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads names of blasphemy. And the beast I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as having been slain to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the earth marveled after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to fight with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great matters and blasphemies. And he was given authority to do so forty-two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against Elohim, to blaspheme his name and his tent and those dwelling in the heaven. <clears throat> And it was given to him to fight with the set-apart ones and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation and all those dwelling on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of, li uh, the book of life of the slain lamb from the foundation of the world shall worship him. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. 
He who brings into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword has to be killed with the sword. Here is the endurance of the belief and the belief of the set apart ones. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great signs so that he even makes fire come down from the heaven on the earth before men. And he leads astray those dwelling on the earth because of those signs which he was given to do before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword, yet lived. And there was given to him to give spirit to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause to be killed as many as would not worship the image of the beast. And he causes all both small and great, and rich and poor, and free and slave, to be given a mark upon their right hand or upon their forehead, and that no one should be able to buy or sell except he that has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. He who has understanding, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, we're going to look at this beast coming out of the sea. Uh, seven heads. They can also be considered seven hills. We'll talk about that. But let's go ahead and really look back some. We get an understanding of this uh, from Daniel's perspective. This is intimately connected to Daniel's vision of these four beasts. Okay. So what does Daniel see in his vision? Well, let's look at Daniel uh, 7 verses 1 through 8. We read as follows. In the first year of Belshazzar, sovereign of Babel, Daniel had a dream and the visions of his head on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, giving a summary of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I was looking in my vision by night and saw the four winds of the heavens stirring up the great sea. This is the Mediterranean, okay? And four beasts. Four great beasts came up from the sea. So now you see these beasts coming out of the sea. Okay. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I was looking until its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and it was given a man's heart. This is understood as the kingdom of Babel. Okay. And see another beast, a second like a bear. And it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said this to it, Arise, devour much flesh. This is understood as the Media Persia kingdom. Okay, this is the Persian kingdom. After this, I looked and saw another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and rule was given to it. This is the Grecian beast, okay? And you see Alexander the Great. Well, you go back to Babel, that's Nebuchadnezzar, Media Persia, which is um, Ahasuerus. Then you have Greece under Alexander the Great, which was broken up into um, the Ptolemy reign as well. It was uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and um, those particular generals that took over his kingdom after he had died. And then verse 7, after this, I looked in the night visions and saw a fourth beast, fearsome and burly, exceedingly strong. And it had great iron teeth It devoured and crushed and trampled down the rest with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I was thinking about the horns and saw another horn, a little one, coming up among them. And three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots before it. And see, eyes like the eyes of a man were in this horn, and a mouth speaking great words. And this is, of course, understood as the Roman Empire. Okay, the unholy Roman Empire. So, these four great beasts... Uh, with seven heads, which some have also looked at as a continuum of the beastly kingdoms, the worldly kingdoms, secular power that had come into power. They weren't all secular because they had a religious slant to them as well, but they were secular in the sense that they were anti-Torah, okay, and they were more of a temporal power, okay, so they were more concerned about governing the earth under their authority, which was man's authority, as opposed to uh, 
um, dealing with it through a theocratic matter. Now, they were theocratic <clears throat> only in the sense that apotheosis was their whole slant of their rulers. Uh, their rulers were made into gods, okay, as opposed to them serving the true and living God. They made their ruler God, and this goes back to Nimrod. Okay, so this was Sumer. You can look at these seven heads as several things. Sumer, Egypt, Assyria, Babel, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So those are seven empires that you can consider these seven heads to be established upon because the spirit, the same spirit, came through all of these different kingdoms as they were all anti-Messianic kingdoms. Um, they were anti-Torah kingdoms. They were anti-Israel kingdoms because they wanted nothing to do with the seed of Yah. And you can see those uh, kingdoms in that uh, role of that great dragon that we just read about last chapter. Um, let's now look at uh, Psalm 83 because they talk about um, 10 crowns, right? 10 horns, 10 horns, 10 powers. Well, who are these 10 powers? I'm just submitting this to you. We can confirm it or deny it. But we're going to look at Psalm 83 in the first, what's this? Eight verses. And, and we're going to check out 10 powers right here. It says, O Elohim, do not remain silent. Do not be still and do not be speechless, O El. For look, your enemies make an uproar and those hating you lift up their head. They craftily plot against your people and conspire against your treasured ones. They have said, come and let us wipe them out as a nation and let the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they have conspired together with one heart. They have made a covenant against you. Now, this is intended to make sure that the covenant that Yah has made with Israel is null and void. There is one leading this campaign who has been completely enraged with Yaakov, or Israel, pretty much since his birth. And the first thing that they mention here, verse 6, it says the tents of Edom. And we know Edom and Jacob have a blood feud with one another. Okay, so this is now Edom in feud with, in, 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 in enmity with uh, Yaakov or Israel and, and the feud of family at times can be worse than anything and we know this uh, throughout history we know this uh, even maybe personally where family has really been some of our worst enemies at times but the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites these are cousins Ishmaelites are cousins okay that's uh, Abraham's seed through Hagar okay so that was Ishmael's brother you have Moab and the Hagarites. So that's four kingdoms right there. Moab, of course, we know is Lot's children. So these are also cousins. Hagar is the mother of Ishmael. Then you have Gabal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia and the inhabitants of Sor. Ashur has also joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot, Selah. Okay, so those are 10 powers right there. Again, Edom, Ishmael, Moab, Hagarites, Gibal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, the inhabitants of Sur, and Ashur. These are ten horns that have confederated themselves to make the name of Israel remembered no more, which is ultimately what the dragon is attempting to do with Israel so that they will be able to rule Undisturbed. Undisturbed. Let's go to uh regarding these names now that is covered on this beast, okay? This beast coming from the sea. Now, of course, it is ultimately embodied in the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to really see how this beast coming from the sea, and the sea, of course, we'll talk about being related uh, to water, and waters is also a symbol of people. So we're going to see how this is related to the Roman Catholic Church with this coming out of the European um, dense population of people um, and how this connects to them. But we're going to look at these names, these names covered in blasphemy. OK, it is covered in names of blasphemy on the heads of these um, this, this beast coming out of the sea with seven heads and all heads were covered in names of blasphemy. And we're going to see something very important as it relates to why this head, the 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 um, location of these names being on the head, 
related to um, a very important principle here. This is Hosea 2, verse 17. It says this, I shall remove the names of the Baals, or the Baalim, from her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Of course, you remember things on your head. So these beasts have a name in their head that they call upon that is blasphemous. It is blasphemous, okay? Um, and so we can see that in Acts of the fourth chapter in the 12th verse, this is what we have to understand. Acts 4 and 12, which reads as follows. And there is no deliverance in anyone else, speaking of Yahushua, for there is no other name under the heaven given among men by which we need to be saved. Now let's look at the seal that Yah has put on his uh, people in Revelation 14. Verse 1, And I looked and saw a lamb standing on Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written upon their forehead. So these beasts are counterfeits. This is the crucial understanding to get out of this. The beast is a counterfeit. It is anti in the sense of counterfeiting. It is opposed to Yah in the sense of a substitute. Okay? This is the white horse with the bow who is going out to conquer. That is counterfeiting the true white horse rider with the tongue of a sword okay this is what the whole matter comes down to and so this name of blasphemy is dealing with all these erroneous names jehovah jesus lord god okay glory um amen okay all these names i will attach all of these pagan names that have been called upon uh, by so many people unknowingly blasphemizing the father, not understanding that he is a jealous L. He gives his esteem to no other. Okay, so when you call upon these erroneous names, you have capitulated to the B system who has hidden, hidden the name of the father from people. Okay, and we know that Yahushua who his name, what his name given to him and revealed to Miriam and Yosef by Gavriel was given to him from heaven. It is a divinely revealed name, but the name that Jesus Christ, the name Jehovah, these are translations that man has done. And this is something that I've been arguing with people about, but they don't seem to get it. You take man's translation of something over what the father revealed and you have become someone who rejects the authority of the father. Okay. Oh, there's power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is. But it's not the power that you think it is, nor the source from where you think it comes from. Okay. So let's just pause there and we're going to not um, belabor that matter because we have a lot to get to in the second verse. Um, it has feet, uh, it looks like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. So it is an amalgamation of these other three beasts. In the Roman Catholic Church, and you even take the word Catholic, it means universal. It has syncretized, which means blended all these foreign ways together and has come up with this one overarching religion. But we're going to look at Matthew 4, 8 and understand this here. Uh, and this authority and this power and this all this power that this beast has because this is very important to understand as well this is matthew 4 8 it says again the devil took him up on a very high mountain this is lucifer of course and showed him all the reins and of the world and their esteem and said to him all these i shall give you if you fall down and worship me so this is the authority of the the power that the dragon or the devil has and that now he has gained authority of all the world, which he gained um, through the fall of Adam. I should have bought this other book. I will note take that, though, and put it in there. Um, and make sure that you all get that and can read it in the scripture sightings below. Um, so we can look at also Isaiah 14 to understand how much authority, worldly, temporal power this beast has. And we'll look at verse 13 and 14 of Isaiah 14. For you have said in your heart, let me go up to the heavens. Let me raise my throne above the stars of El. And let me sit in the mount of appointment on the sides of the north. Let me go up above the heights of the clouds. And let me be like the most high. So he desires his own kingdom. 
And this is what this is coming down to. Okay, so this is the authority that he gave to this beast. The dragon gave authority to the beast. Okay. And so we know that this dragon bowed to, I'm sorry, this beast bowed to the dragon. He worships the dragon. He calls upon the name of the dragon. And when you see the Easter <laughs> vigil that the Catholics have, they invoke the name of, they call it Lucifer, okay? And that is Lucifer. So they invoke this name and worship him. There is even in the catacombs underneath the Vatican, a chamber room specifically for uh, Lucifer. And I will put those in the resources. Lucifer tomb and invocation that will be posted in the resources. You can look this up yourself, okay? And of course, um, man, this uh, recent announcement of the resignation of the general superior of the uh, Society of Jesus, uh, Nicholas Adolfo Pajon, who is resigning because he is under pressure from the International Criminal Court for the investigation of um, murder and ritual, ritual murder and child, um, what's the word, trafficking, sex trafficking, due to the Ninth Circle Magisterial Rite, which is a satanic practice that all popes since like the 14th century have been undergoing, um, as well as some other high officials of other countries have been... Um, counter uh have been active in and so um these are some of the worship rituals that are done to empower their master their dark lord so to speak so verse three talks about and i saw one of his heads as having been slain and has deadly wound he was healed and all the earth marveled after it now i must really have to give you all these articles for that one because <laughs> you won't believe that that has already been fulfilled. Many people are looking for that to be fulfilled. But just in short, before uh, I read this verse, well, let me read the verse first, and then I'll go ahead and explain some things to you. But this is Ezekiel 21, verses 18 to 24. Read as follows. And the word of Yah came to me, saying again, And you, son of man, appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the sovereign of Babel to go, both of them coming from one land and place a signpost, put it at the head of the way to the city, upon the way for the sword to go to Rabbah and to the Ammon of the Ammonites and to Yehuda and to the walls of Jerusalem. For the sovereign of Babel shall stand at the parting of the way at the fork of the two ways to practice divination. He shall shake the arrows. He shall ask the household idols. He shall look at all this liver. In his right hand shall be the divination of Jerusalem to set up battering rams, to call for murder, to lift the voice with shouting, and to set battering rams against the gates, to heap up a siege mound, to build a wall. And it shall be to them a false divination in the eyes of those who have sworn oaths to them, but he is bringing their crookedness to remembrance so that they are taking. Therefore, thus said the Master Yah, because you have made your crookedness to be remembered, in that your transgressions are covered, so that your sins are seen in your deeds, because you have been remembered, you are taken by hand okay so this is speaking of not only jerusalem but also of the the king of babel and what you have to understand is that rome at one point in time in 1798 under emperor napoleon of france's decree a general was sent to rome by the name of berthier and deposed the pope and completely cut off the temporal power mortally wounding the vatican and making it no more. Okay, so they effectively just made Rome, uh, the Vatican more particularly, which was Europe's most powerful institution and Europe's most powerful throne, um, no more active. It was defunct. But in 1923, under Benito Mussolini, which gives you a 1290 day period, they signed the Lateran Treaty and healed that mortal wound. And since then, the world has been marveling, particularly with the inauguration of Jorge Borgoglio, Cardinal Jorge Borgoglio from Argentina. The world has marveled after this beast. They have marveled after this beast, okay? 
But this is something that has already happened. Revelation is well done for the most part. Okay, so we're just waiting for the Messiah to appear. Well, really, the, the man of lawlessness, which we can actually say is here right now. Okay, and so uh, as he's supposed to be the world's most for most uh, moral authority. And we're seeing his stance on what he's saying, homosexuality. We're seeing the stance of the priests and how they are covering them and, and just reshifting them around to perish to perish without truly doing a lot of um, reprimand for what their abominable behavior is. So, um, yeah, I'm going to have some articles to show you that, too. As far as verse 4 is concerned, they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who was like the beast, who was able to fight with him? And this is just audacity right here, because what we have to understand, this is almost, word for word, a quote that Israel gave when they were delivered from Egypt. This is uh, Exodus 15, verse 11. It says this, because we know Yah is a man of war. Yah is a man of battle. Verse 3 of Exodus 15 says that Yah is a man of battle. Yah is his name. Okay, so you can't contest Yah. And we read last yesterday how if Yah is for us, who can be against us? Okay, we are more than conquerors in Yah. But the problem is when our faith is suspect and we see some great signs and things, we're like, oh, we get enamored and we start to doubt. Okay, much like Kepha walking on the water, got distracted when the wind started blowing. All he had to do was keep his eyes fixed on the master and keep his faith centered in that, his faithfulness centered in that, and he would have been okay. But it says this in verse 11, 15 of Exodus, verse 11. Who was like you, O Yah, among the mighty ones? Who was like you, great in set apartness, awesome in praises, working wonders this is what we need to understand so while they're talking about who's like the beast we need to be like who's like our elohim none is like almighty one none okay but the problem is they have been given over to this delusion their names are not written in the book of life and as a result they have been deceived to think that this is the greatest power ever on earth and it may have some power yeah it's it shed a lot of blood it's martyred a lot of people but love not your life even unto the death is what the scripture says. Now, I'm not saying don't fight for your life. If you can fight for your life, fight for your life. Life is by all means to be lived and carried out. But at the same time, we got to understand there is a greater reality that we will enter into. Okay. <clears throat> Much greater reality. So verse five talks about him giving. Uh, we're going to also, I'm sorry, let's go to Daniel three. Verse 3 through 7, okay? So, uh, they all marvel and they worship the beast. This is verse 4 now, I'm saying. Um, they worship the beast. So, how do you worship this beast? We're going to look at the book of Daniel real quick. Chapter 3, verses uh, 3 through 7, I believe. Yes, sir. 3 through 7. Check this out. Then the viceroys, the nobles, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, and the, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that sovereign Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So notice, this is a government. This is the first beast that Daniel recognized. So he has all these officials, right, carrying out his decrees to, on the people, and the people observe them and obey them, and they worship this beast. Check it out. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald loudly, loudly proclaimed, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of instruments, you shall fall down and do obeisance to the gold image that sovereign Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and do obeisance is immediately thrown into the midst of a burning furnace of fire. There's the threat of death. So as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of instruments, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and did obeisance to the gold image that sovereign Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And we know that in this book, according to this book of Daniel, this scroll, only three souls did not bow. Okay? That is Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, who the world unfortunately knows as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which was not their names. Those are blasphemous names that give honor to the gods of Babylon, whereas Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah give esteem and praise to the Father. Okay? 
because they changed their name to destroy the cultural uh, reality of who Israel was. Again, let the name of Israel be remembered no more, they said. So these are nations that were intent on doing that. But this is how they worship the beast. They bowed to it when they heard the music playing. So what is music doing to people today but causing them to worship the deities of uh, Mystery Babylon? So now we look at the fifth verse. He's given a mouth speaking great matters and blasphemies. 42 months. Of course, we know Daniel 7.25 also talks about this. These blasphemies where he says this. And it speaks words against the Most High. And it wears out the set apart ones of the Most High. And it intends to change appointed times and law. And they are given into its hand for a time and times and half a time. That's the 42 months that we read about. But it's blasphemies. Okay, this is all it's doing is it's speaking words against the Most High. And I got some articles to put about the words against Most High that are being spoken um, by a lot of people. You'd be surprised are doing so. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how bold people are today to speak against Torah to exalt themselves and um you know this has been going on for a long time but we're going to see it even in modern time but the one thing you can really see is how the church the catholic church particularly um has blasphemed and spoken great and mighty things against the most high incredible <clears throat> uh verse six well let's i'm sorry there's some other verses this is jude 16 it says this these are grumblers Complainers who walk according to their own lusts and their mouth speak proudly, admiring faces of others for their own sake. These are because you got to understand the beast is an intricate, in, intimate and intricate system. It is not only composed of the government itself, but it has supporters. Those who support it, those that have been marked by this beast are also those who are uh, speaking these proud, boastful things. So to see what I'm saying a little more in depth, let's look at Second Timothy four. Or three, and listen to this. It says, But know this, that in the last days hard times shall come. For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of silver, boasters, proud, blasphemers, obe disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence but denying its power, and turn away from these. And from among those, and from among them, are those who creep into how creep into households and captivate silly women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as Yohan and Mamre, the two um, Baal Balaam sons, who were the Egyptian uh, priests that also turned the water to blood and did some other the miracles. Um, they oppose Moshe, Yohan and Mamre oppose Moshe, so do also these oppose the truth. Men of corrupt minds found worthless concerning the belief, but they shall not go on further, for their folly shall be obvious to all, as also that, though, that of those men became. So we can see how this is taking over a lot of people, and um, the spirit that is exuding from the Vatican is also taking over a lot of people. And, and don't be deceived, for even uh, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Okay? This is, we, we know this. Satan masquerades as an angel of light and counterfeits himself as one who does good when we know that the good that he does is only to hide and camouflage the wicked deeds that he is doing that we are not capturing and seeing. So we're going to go now to the 6th verse of the Revelation 13, how he blasphemes the name of the Father, his tent and those dwelling on the earth. We're going to look at a couple of verses, um, starting with Daniel 11. And we're going to look at 31 through 39. And if it pauses... Which I'm going to go ahead and pause right here and then uh, come back and uh, do part two. So we're going to pause right here. <laughs> 